This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So what we're going to go through and look at now is how to measure working capital. We've spoken about the different types of policies, uh, your aggressive policy, uh, your conservative policy, and then that policy in between, uh, your, your moderate policy. Uh, but how do we go through there and measure the level of working capital that we have within a business? Uh, so what we're going to go through and start off with is we're going to look at a couple of ratios. The ratios are relevant here within F1, but, but they're also very relevant as well as we move forward into F2 territory at a later date. Uh, likewise, as well, if you're thinking about your case study uh, at your operations level here, I do think that you won't be asked to calculate ratios in, in the case study, but you may be given ratios and asked to discuss them. So I think it's important that you understand the ratios and where they come from so that you can then go through and interpret them correctly. OK, so it's not just about the calculations. It's also about the understanding. OK, so let's go through first of all uh, to measure working capital or essentially first of all to measure. I refer to you as your liquidity. We can look at the current ratio, uh, current ratio, nice and simple ratio to calculate uh, looks at the number of times. So measures it as a basis of X to one that the current assets cover your current liabilities. So current assets, uh, inventory, receivables, cash. Current liabilities, any payables, so trade payables, interest payables, uh, dividend payables, whatever payable, tax payable you could have uh, will be incorporated in it. And you would like to have an excess of current assets over current liability. So in an ideal world, it should be greater than one. OK, uh, if it's greater than one, that tends to mean there that the, the business is liquid. Uh, do be careful, however, uh, there's no hard and fast rules, but supermarkets do tend to have a ratio that is actually less than one now that's not necessarily because they are illiquid uh, but that is just because of the type of current assets that it holds and the type of current assets that they hold are very fast moving aren't they they're very perishable they're food items so the level of inventory that they hold is very very low the level of receivables that they have is also very low because supermarkets don't sell goods to you or i on credit okay when was the last time you walked out of a shop with some goods and said, see you later and I'll pay you in 30 days time. They'd drag you back straight away, wouldn't they? OK, so they have a very low level of current assets, but a very high level of current liabilities because they have a lot of power over their suppliers. They dictate, if you like, the payment terms uh, to when they pay their, their local suppliers and their farmers. So they have a high level of current liabilities, a low level of current assets. So a current ratio that's less than one. That doesn't mean to say that they are illiquid. You know, when was the last supermarket that, that you heard of that, that became illiquid and, uh, and went bust? OK, uh, doesn't happen, does it? Uh, so the ratio may not tell the true picture. OK, but be able to calculate it, be able to accept that a supermarket has a ratio of less than one. Uh, other industries, 1.6, 1.7 tends to be the norm and obviously if the ratio is decreased from last year then that means that we are a little bit less liquid but again don't forget to have a look at the cash balance because cash is the key to liquidity isn't it uh, it does talk about some other assets to go through and think about there are some sort of other factors i should say to consider uh looks there at your asset quality so you may have what appears to be an appropriate current ratio but if you have old obsolete inventory uh, if your receivables ha have a very long collection period and are overdue, then the quality of those assets is pretty poor and they won't necessarily be readily convertible into cash, will they? So therefore renders the ratio that little bit less useful and also seasonality. Uh, the holiday industry is obviously very seasonal. A lot more people are on holiday in the summer, so that will have an impact on the current assets and the current liabilities. So as you progress through the year, the assets and the liabilities will fluctuate and as to will the ratio. OK, again, if there is a fall in the ratio may not necessarily mean that the business is, is less liquid. It could just be due to the part of the year whereby they have a very high level of liabilities before they then pay their suppliers. OK, uh, current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. Uh, you've then got the quick ratio or the acid test, uh, which is a little bit of a better measurement, if you like, of your liquidity, because it removes the least liquid asset being inventory. OK, 
uh, what you can go through and do there. Obviously, if there's a reduction in the quick ratio, that would bring about potential liquidity concerns. But a good thing to do is to compare the quick ratio and the current ratio. Uh, and that is then to see that if the, the change in the current ratio, if there's a bigger increase in the current ratio than there is in the quick ratio, then that must mean, therefore, that your stock levels are increasing. Okay, Because the, the current ratio must be increasing because you have incorporated stock. Uh, and if the ratio has gone up, it must be that those stock levels have increased because everything else is the same, isn't it? All the remaining current assets and current liabilities should be the same. Okay. Excellent. We then go on to, to measure specific working capital balances. Uh, so starting to look a little bit more at how efficiently you use your inventory receivable and payables. So we go through there and start to look at the number of days uh, which it takes us to get the inventory off our shelves. So what we go through and do there is we look at the inventory that we have in the year or at the year end. So the figure on the statement of financial position. We divide that by our cost of sales. So it's expressing the inventory uh, as a proportion of the year of our total annual cost of sales. And then to work out that on an annual basis, we multiply by 365 days. OK, uh, if you have an increase in the number of days, that means that you are holding your inventory for longer. So therefore, you may then have, if you like, uh, the risk of additional holding costs, the risk of old inventory and therefore obsolescence which can reduce your profitability. If, however, you have a reduction in your inventory days, that could be because you are selling your inventory quicker. Maybe you have offered discounts on, on the sale of the goods to get rid of it quicker. Uh, it could also be as well that maybe you bought uh, some goods uh, that, that, that were necessarily cheaper. OK, uh, well, that's going through there and, and looking at your, your inventory days. Uh, we then got your trade receivables collection period. Should we call it receivable days to URI? Uh, again, it takes an SFP figure, receivables. Divide it by your sales. Technically speaking, if we wanted to be 100% correct from a management accounting perspective, that should be your credit sales. Obviously, if your cash sales are minimum, then just use your total revenue. But specifically, we should be using there your, your credit sales. Again, once you've worked out your trade receivables collection period or receivable days, uh, you can then see there if there's been an increase or if there has been a decrease. Uh, that then allows you to see how effectively your debts are being collected. You know, if there is an increase in the number of days that it takes you to collect the cash, then that shows that there is a lack of efficiency. But if there is a reduction in the number of days, then obviously that is an improvement within the efficiency. OK. Uh, obviously, if there's an increase in the days, that brings about a little bit more risk uh, because, therefore, if there's an increased risk of lack of recoverability and therefore an increased risk of your irrecoverable debts, which goes through there, doesn't it, and reduces profitability. OK, uh, if we then go through and then have a look, is it at your trade payables payment period, uh, payable days to you and I? Again, what we go through and do there is we take a statement of financial position figure at the top. So here it's my payables. We work it out as a proportion. It says cost of sales, but again, specifically, that should be your credit purchases. OK, if you're given cost of sales, use it. If you can work out your credit purchases, use it. OK. Uh, and then multiply by the 365 days. And all it does is it shows you how long you take to pay your suppliers. Obviously, the longer, the better for the business in terms of cash and keeping the cash back from the payment of the suppliers. But that increases the risk, doesn't it? Uh, it, it could indicate that you have liquidity issues. Uh, and it also increases the risk, doesn't it, of losing your suppliers' goodwill. OK, uh, if your days have gone down. That means you paid your suppliers more quickly. Maybe you've taken advantage of some prompt payment discounts. Uh, and that will go through there and encourage you to pay quicker. And it will also actually increase your profitability ever so slightly, because what you have there is your discounts received, don't we? Uh, discounts received are a credit balance in profit or loss. So we'll therefore go through and increase your profitability ever so slightly. OK.
So I think that with to do with your inventory days, receivable days, payable days, remember it's an SFP figure divided by a profit or loss figure and make sure you're specific about the profit or loss figure and make sure that you multiply by 365 days if your period is one year. If you're looking at a six monthly period, then you need to make sure there that you take, is it half of the 365 days? Uh, if it's quarterly period that you are looking at with regards to your revenues and costs, then you need to take a quarter of the 365 days. So just be aware when it comes to particular objective test questions in case they become a little bit more picky about the calculation. OK, uh, so that's it in terms of talking about the ratios and what they actually mean and the interpretation of them. What we'll do is we'll pause it there where it gives you a bit of time to go through and check that you're happy with the ratios themselves and what they mean before in the next video we go through there and start crunching some numbers.